So welcome to the High Walk uh, at Brantwood. The High Walk's different really from all the other gardens at Brantwood in one very important and uh, delightful respect and that is that it's actually not on a slope. It's, uh, it's level ground here for you. Um, and it was designed with that very much in mind. It was designed by Ruskin's cousin, Joan Seven. Uh, Joan had moved here to support Ruskin during his mental illness in 1878. And she continued to live here and raise her family. They very much made Brant with their own. Uh, now, Joan wasn't an intellectual, um, uh, but she was absolutely devoted to Ruskin and totally convinced of his greatness. So she was here very much to support Ruskin. But you can imagine that she was surrounded by Ruskin's heavy philosophical, intellectual and artistic interests. And that was in the gardens as well as uh, indoors. And she just desperately needed somewhere where she could go and have a sort of civilised walk in the countryside. Um, something genteel, something beautiful, um, and somewhere where she could walk with her friends. And so it was that she built, created the High Walk. And the High Walk is one of those gardens that uses what is known as the borrowed landscape. And of course, at Brantwood, you have a landscape to die for in terms of what you can borrow. So the great view of the mountains of the Coniston Old Man and the, uh, and the lake was something that was here to be taken into the garden. So it's an engineered terrace. Um, Ruskin liked terraces, as we have seen with the um, uh, zigzaggy and uh, the painter's glade. He created terraces in the landscape here. Uh, Joan created the largest terrace at Brantwood. Uh, and she, um, she gave it uh, a flavour of planting which was in line with the greatest trends of the day really. It's what's known as the wild garden movement. Um, uh, it's full of large shrubs uh, and uh, particularly azaleas, uh, rhododendron uh, and many of the ones that you see here today are the ones that Joan herself planted. So I've been working up here on the high walk this morning. Um, and this is in a way one of our more formal areas and so we do tend to stick to the planting you know strictly ornamental planting along here but we can never quite stick perfectly to ornamental planting and this is one area that i'm highlighting as somewhere that i chose to let some what would commonly be called weeds grow as well because i think it looks really nice so we've got this mixture of of Regersia, which absolutely loves it up here. So we've got several clumps of Regersia. Now that is an ornamental, um, but we've got it alongside a Wygelia, which is flowering really nicely at the moment. And then, but then this little mixture here that I think the colors all look really lovely together. We've got the self-seeded Jacob's Ladder, which is an ornamental, but it does, it gets around a bit. And then we've got Buttercups and Red Campion as well which are very definitely weeds but i just think they look charming and along with self-seeded foxgloves everywhere and in the back we've got ligularia which is again another ornamental and so oh the birch as well is self-seeded but i think it actually makes quite a pleasing scene altogether. so whereas in most of the border i'll be weeding out the buttercups and the red campion and even sometimes the jacob's ladder and foxgloves but in this little patch they make such a nice scene i thought i'd leave them one of the delights of the approach to the high walk is the maple walk um, it's a beautiful path which as you can see uh, ascends towards the high walk uh, through a uh, through a symphony of color um, in particular the spring and the autumn the um, rhododendron in the spring particularly but also the aces or aples themselves have a wonderful amount of color just as the leaves are coming out and then subsequently um, in the autumn uh, those maple leaves turn the most amazing sort of scarlet colour uh, and coat the ground. So this is a beautiful walk as you ascend towards the high walk, um, but it takes you through all sorts of other delights. Um, we, when we restored this and cut back the overgrowth and woodland that had uh, uh, dominated the area, we found that there were an orchard, there were apple trees here growing on the slopes. And some of these apple trees have survived. And indeed, two years after we managed to uh, expose them again, they started to bear fruit. So they are a good age um, and it's wonderful to have them. 
Uh, talking of the age of plants, uh, aces don't last uh, that long, uh, and bees are quite a good age now. Uh, and so we're in the process also of replacing them. And as you go up the high, uh, up the maple walk on the right hand side towards the top, uh, you'll see young uh, maples which we've been putting in to create a new avenue higher uh, along the way. The Acer palmatum is so named because the leaf is roughly a hand shape or a palm. So the palm is from palmatum is from palm, and these ones have got five to seven little sort of leaflets. Uh, they're normally an understory tree, so they tend to stay quite small, and they don't mind being in a little bit of shade. And you'll find them growing underneath larger trees. But these ones, they're getting quite big. This is probably about as big as an Acer palmatum will get. So they were planted perhaps, well, from 1870 onwards when Joan Seven arrived at, at Brantwood. Um, and she had probably never seen a Japanese Acer before, certainly not a mature one, because they weren't, there were not many in the country at that point. So she took that leap of faith and she had some seeds, the, the same type of seed as the sycamore Samara with its double wing little seed structure that then helicopters off and so someone would have sown those so these are not clones so we're really lucky um, in that these trees are fertile and they do occasionally self-seed they're not prolific self-seeders not like sycamores are where you're always pulling them out of everywhere but what the team here have done is they have actually found some of those seedlings and managed to transplant them and I'm going to go and take you just up there and show you where we've planted some of those seedlings. So these are some of the seedlings that have been potted up uh, from underneath the big aces. Um, as you can see, they're in big metal cages. It's not because we think they're going to escape, but more that some deer might have a little tromp on the leaves. Um, so we've got a little series of them got one slightly larger one to my right and two slightly younger ones uh, that are just a little bit further over there on my left. Um, I'd say they range from about maybe four years to about eight years um, and yeah hopefully they're gonna survive and in a hundred years time they'll be as big as those ones over there and they should be able you'll be able to see them from the road um, and yeah, it's just a really nice, lovely, lovely bit of colour in this part of the garden. So Howard was telling you about the apple trees that we've got here. Uh, this is one of the apple trees that Joan planted. It's a Galloway Pippin. Um, Gallo so all apple trees are clones, generally, um, because that's the only way to get your, the variety of apple that, you're, that you want. Uh, because apples don't come true from seed and if you're interested in apples then I'm sure you'll go and find out more about what that means. Uh, so this is a Galloway Pippin which is not the most common um, apple tree today but it would have been fairly common um, 100 years ago or so. So we're really lucky to have this one and it's surviving however it isn't in the best of health which again is no wonder because it is very old. The higher portion of the main trunk is actually rotting um, which is to be expected. But that's a really, potentially a really useful habitat for all sorts of creatures. Um, and we don't want to remove it, both for habitat, but also because we don't think it would actually prolong the life of this tree. Because I suspect that the rot has traveled all the way down the trunk and we wouldn't, we wouldn't be able to cut low enough to cut that rot out. So what we're doing instead is we've got a sort of a two pronged attack we're keeping the top very light. We keep pruning any weight because it's still growing vigorously. But if we allowed it to put on any heavy growth at the top of this main trunk, then it would snap at a much lower point. Uh, and then we would lose, we, that would lose an opportunity to keep the tree alive longer. Uh, what is quite interesting, I don't know if you can see this hollow in the tree there. If you are stood right next to the trunk, you can actually look up and you can see straight through the trunk and you can see the sky above. 
Um, so we keep pruning it a bit. But one of the other things I've done is I took off some scion, which is the young unfruited wood, and I grafted some apple trees. And they're down in our backstage uh, propagation area right now. And the graft, I only took it this year, but there, it has put on some extension growth. So I'm really hopeful, hopeful that that graft is going to be successful. And whilst the Galloway Pippin is an apple that still exists and I could buy another one, it's really nice to use the actual plant material from the plant that Joan Seven herself planted. So we're really, really pleased. I'm really pleased the grafts have taken. So the other part of what we're trying to do to extend the life of this tree is whereas so we're taking that we're keeping the weight down and then it's got its main structure of branches coming up which is great uh, but when, once the rot reaches those branches and those branches start to fail we've actually got some young branches out coming out from lower down the trunk so this is one of them and so what we've decided to do is we're just trying to very very gently train them out so we've got some wire um, with a bit of bindweed so we're just trying to train them out so that when we do lose that top portion hopefully these other branches lower down will be able to provide enough leaf cover to keep that enough photosynthesis going to keep the main trunk alive for that little bit longer um, and hopefully that will give us enough time for some of our grafts to really solidify and then we should be able to plant them out somewhere. Proper care for this garden would have been abandoned in the late 1920s uh, when Joan died, uh, followed by Arthur, and uh, the house really um, fell into disrepair. So the staff abandoned it and this sort of garden gradually became overgrown. And indeed, if you'd been here 15, 20 years ago, uh, all you'd have seen was woodland. Uh, the whole of the garden had been completely and utterly um, overgrown and disappeared under a tangle of, of overgrowth of, uh, of trees, birch and um, briars and so forth. So it was, we knew it was here. Uh, we had the um, photographs of it taken in the early part of the 20th century. We had drawings of it and we had lots of descriptions. Uh, there were people even living who had remembered it, but it had gone. And uh, we decided that we would restore it. While the restoration of the gardens has uh, involved the um, cultivation and the support of many of, the, of Joan's original plantings, uh, of course the gardeners have added uh, many new ones which are there to interpret and to, um, uh, to beautify the whole, uh, the whole garden. Uh, and not least of all, the Mechanopsis poppy. Uh, the Mechanopsis is a particularly beautiful uh, pop poppy which uh, was chosen for Brantwood because of its colour. This colour blue was Ruskin's favourite blue. And when I say favourite, I mean favourite. He actually painted his mother's coffin blue in this colour. Um, uh, he wore a blue necktie his entire life. And the portrait of Ruskin, a three and a half, uh, that sits in the dining room at Brantwood, has Ruskin dressed with blue slippers and a blue sash around his waist. So this was a colour of importance to Ruskin. It was the colour of heaven uh, and uh, one that he wore all his life. Lining the uh, paths in places uh, towards the high walk and indeed other paths around the estate, you'll notice a, a small plant, a delicate little plant that doesn't look like anything very special. Um, but actually it's quite an important plant and a, and, a, and a rare one. This is Touch Me Not Balsam. And Touch Me Not Balsam is a rare plant in Britain. Um, uh, it grows on disturbed ground, generally speaking. And uh, uh, there are very few places where it grows prolifically, but for some reason it grows very happily here at Brantwood. Uh, indeed, probably from a gardener's point of view, a little too happily. But the beauty of this plant resides not just in the rather lovely little yellow flower that will come to it and the seed pod which when you touch it will burst uh, hence called touch me not um, but it has a very special other quality and that is that it's the host plant for the netted carpet moth and the netted carpet moth is even rarer than the plant itself it's a red book moth um, and uh, it's a sweet small moth with a, a white background and a sort of black brownish 
um, netted pattern on it um, and it's young uh, bees on this plant this is its food plant so once a year the moth survey comes here uh, and counts the number of netted carpet moths that they can find in an evening uh, and we're very happy to host it